still somewhat controversial, um, and there's a lot of data that have emerged to suggest that eating or overeating in some situations can result in a behavioral state that resembles an addiction. Um, a lot of this work has come from preclinical studies, and so these are studies that have been done in, in rodents, like laboratory rats. Um, but those studies have suggested that there are similar changes in the brain and similar behaviors that emerge when animals are overeating things like a high-fat diet or a high-sucrose diet that are like what one would see if an animal was dependent on a drug of abuse. There's also some recent data that's coming out of clinical experiments um, using either brain imaging studies and also some survey research that's been done on populations of patients who have binge eating disorder. And those studies do also suggest that there is a link between overeating or binge eating and perhaps aspects of addiction. So while it's still somewhat of a young field and it's certainly in no means completely all figured out, I think that there are a lot of data out there that are suggesting that there are overlaps in these two disorders that certainly warrants for further investigation. In the studies that we initiated on food addiction, we really just set out to see if we could identify aspects of addiction in animals that were overeating food. And so what we did was we took the criteria that were laid out for characterizing substance abuse. And so we took those criteria and basically adapted them to study food. And so it was just interesting that we would do all these different experiments and we just kept finding that food was able to do the same thing that we were seeing with drugs and abuse. We have a lot of different things that are going on in the lab in addition to studying food addiction. We're also interested in aspects of other eating disorders and how they may relate to addiction. We have an animal model in which we have animals overeating sugar and then we have them also equipped with something called a gastric fistula. And this is basically just a small screw that we surgically implant in their stomach so that when we open the screw, whatever the animal ingests will leave through the stomach. So in many ways, it's sort of like an animal model of bulimia because the animals are binging on the sugar, but then when we have the gastric fistula open, they're purging the contents of their stomach. So although it's very difficult to model lots of eating disorders because of the strong social and cultural and personality issues that are also involved, we can model a lot of the behaviors associated with these disorders. And so um, that's one of the, you know, the exciting things that we're working on right now as well. Um, we're also doing some stuff with anorexia nervosa. We're interested in activity-based anorexia as a model of anorexia nervosa. This is when rats are offered a running wheel and we'll find that if they have limited access to food in a running wheel, they actually prefer to run than eat. And so they'll run and run and run and they'll develop a phenotype that it very much resembles what one would see in an anorexic patient. There is some controversy because traditionally um, in our experiments we, we often use male rats. Um, and that's because female rats have their estrous cycle every three to four days and with the estrous cycle comes fluctuation in brain neurotransmitter baselines. And so for our purposes we tend to try to use male rats because they're more stable in terms of their baseline neurochemical profiles and also behavioral profiles. Um, so many of the studies that we've done have been in male rats. We have done some studies in females but largely we've done studies in males. And that's somewhat opposite of the profile that you see with most eating disorders. Anorexia and bulimia are most often seen in patients who are female as opposed to male, although male patients do have those disorders as well. The same with binge eating, um, although there seems to be, you know, somewhat more gender, more, uh, you see binge eating more so in both genders as opposed to just specifically in one gender. Um, so that is one of the limitations of the rat studies, one of the many limitations of using rodents um, for this type of research. Um, and it also raises an interesting question of whether or not there are differences that exist in the effects that we might observe in males versus female rats in terms of just the behaviors and the neurochemical changes, and those are just things we haven't explored yet. Much like there are differences in the reasons, presumably, that women and men might engage in these, or might develop eating disorders, or certainly could be differences in the way that they would be expressed in animal models. It was somewhat shocking because we weren't necessarily expecting to see that there would be this much overlap between the two. But it makes sense because we know based on sort of the basic neurophysiology that our brains evolved to reinforce behaviors like foods and sexual behavior. These are the things that we need to do in order to survive as a species. We need to eat, we need to mate. That's the bottom line. 
And so there's neural circuitry in our brain that was developed to make sure that we find those things pleasurable and that we want to do them. And so it turns out that drugs of abuse actually act upon that brain system. So they're hijacking the brain system that was put there to make sure that we want to eat and that we want to reproduce. And so it makes sense that since we know drugs of abuse are clearly very addictive, that food can therefore perhaps be addictive since it's working on that same brain system. It's been um, bandied about, I think, for, for a while. I think with the increase in the obesity epidemic, people started to become more and more creative in their thinking as to, well, why is this happening? It was such an abrupt increase that, you know, people were becoming obese and overweight in this country and in a lot of developed countries throughout the world that um, sort of other ideas started to come up. Um, and there had been talk about food addiction in sort of pop media. There were a lot of self-help books written by people who would say that that they're addicted to sugar and they're addicted to certain foods and if you cut those foods out you feel much better and they don't feel like they're addicted anymore. Um, but there really was no empirical evidence of it. And so that's really what stimulated my interest in this field and my interest in studying this. And this was about 10 years ago. And at that time, like I said, it was very challenging because there really was no field of food addiction. There weren't really a lot of people at all studying it. And so we had to really just start from scratch. We had to develop an animal model. And it was a challenge at first because, like I said, there weren't a lot of people studying it, so our group was really the only people doing it. And, um, you know, it took some convincing to get people to really listen, but I've noticed that over the past, I'd say, five years, that things have kind of changed. And I think now that more and more researchers have become interested in this, and there's other labs that have replicated our work and expanded on it. There are preclinical researchers now studying it um, in a variety of different ways. to China um, a couple of months ago to give a talk um, at the Chinese Nutrition Society because they're having a really big problem in China with obesity in their children. Um, they're worried about the fact that as the children are aging, they're already seeing obesity in, in preschool children. And so if this trend continues, what's it going to be when they become adults? And we see the same thing in the United States. There's a lot of children who are you know, preschool age or younger that are now becoming obese. And a lot of it has to do with the diet that they're consuming. And so um, clearly that should be you know, a focus of some efforts.